All right, here we go. Welcome, Facebook friends, uh, future Instagram or YouTube friends. We'll get that posted uh, as soon as we get finished here. Uh, but Dr. Brandon Money here from the Centeno Schultz Clinic, the top five golf guy. We're going to deviate a little bit away from golf today just because I think this episode, uh, episode number four of our series is really, really important. Probably the most important episode uh, we've done so far as far as education uh, for patients is concerned. And so I do want to give a special shout out to my wife, who's probably listening or will be soon. Happy birthday, dear. I'll be home soon so we can celebrate. Okay, top five of the day. Top five questions to ask your doctor about orthobiologics. Now, these aren't questions to ask your family doctor or your internal medicine doctor or your cardiologist because, frankly, they probably won't have any answers to this. This is somebody that's in sports medicine, somebody that claims they can do orthobiologics-type treatments. Uh, those types of folks are these questions you want to be geared towards simply because they're the ones that may or may not be recommending certain procedures or other treatment options. And so without further ado, a little bit about me, Dr. Brandon Money here. I am board certified by the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Uh, I am also fellowship trained in interventional orthopedics uh, from our wonderful clinic here in Broomville, Colorado, Centennial Schultz Clinic, the world leader in orthobiologics-based treatment. Uh, I am a golf enthusiast, uh, although uh, my wife would use the word obsessed, but that's okay. She can think what she wants. I am certified by the Titleist Performance Institute as a medical expert in the golf world. And if you want to see my random postings of golf, uh, work-related stuff, all of that, uh, just follow me at uh, Golf Doc USA on Instagram. Okay, here we go. So what are orthobiologics? Before we really get into our top five and uh, maybe a little bonus at the end. Um, so orthobiologics are, are different types of materials or substances that are used to assist and facilitate tissue healing. And there's a ton of different research that's going on now uh, in the world of orthobiologics for not only orthopedic and musculoskeletal conditions, what uh, we focus on, but you know, brain injury, spinal cord injury, autoimmune conditions, multiple sclerosis, uh, autism, COPD. There's a lot of people out there that claim they can uh, cure a lot of this stuff, but simply put, uh, for those things, the research really isn't there yet. There's lots of research regarding uh, orthopedics and musculoskeletal conditions uh, regarding orthobiologics, uh, but for some of the other stuff, that's still pretty early uh, overall. And there's a lot of different types of, of synthetic and uh, organic substances, including bone marrow, uh, platelets from your bloodstream, adipose, hyaluronic acid, demineralized bone matrix, prolotherapy, and other things that are utilized, uh, and really to enhance the body's natural healing capabilities. Uh, and, and so the human body has an amazing possibility of healing. We do it every single day because we damage tissue every day. That's a part of life. And there's over a thousand growth factors or healing factors in our body that act as uh, kind of the, uh, the boost for the repair cells of our body uh, to be able to help heal some of these damaged tissue. Uh, unfortunately, we know that many of these tissues just don't have very good blood supply, which does limit the healing potential of that tissue in certain circumstances. And uh, orthobiologics can be autologous. And autologous means basically from your own body, your own platelets, your own own bone marrow, your own adipose, so on and so forth. Uh, allergenic uh, means it comes from somebody else or uh, a pool of other people um, that aren't yourself. All right. So number one question you need to ask before you undergo an orthobiologics procedure, what treatment options do I have? So there's lots of different treatments available, lots of different options for you. Some we just mentioned, here's some more as well. You know, more conservative things, red light therapy, chiropractic, physical therapy, and the derivatives of those, uh, shockwave therapy, uh, corticosteroid injections. I'm not the biggest fan of those, but there's thousands and thousands of them that are done in the United States and across the world every single day. Uh, and, and then surgery is, is certainly an option in, in a lot of cases for patients. And don't get me wrong, my definition of needing surgery is a lot different than a surgeon's definition 
situation of needing surgery. And that's okay because we just have different tools available to us. And, and really a competent physician is gonna be able to, pro to provide you a variety of those treatment options. And probably more importantly, explain why some of these may not be appropriate for you and for your given situation. And also help answer what's the ideal treatment modality specifically for you and why. And this is so variable because we're humans. We're not robots. Not everybody has the same condition, the same severity, the same overall health status. And we have to be mindful of that when we are making these recommendations. Okay, next. Number two, is the doctor trained in orthobiologics? And so... There are fellowships out there. There's a few, a small handful that are specifically in the field of interventional orthopedics, specifically in this. And the reason why I say that is because we don't learn this stuff in medical school, in residency training. That was eight years of my life. And during those eight years, I actually had to go out on my own and learn about this. I traveled to over a dozen different workshops and conferences during my residency training in order to get this specific education because I knew that this is what I wanted to dedicate my career to. And so after those eight years, as I alluded to before, I did another year of fellowship here at the Centennial Schultz Clinic. And uh, as you can imagine, th this isn't something that you can learn in a quick weekend course. Yeah, it can help provide information, but it's all cumulative in nature. And you have to uh, learn all of these different areas and how they work together in order to ultimately provide the most accurate diagnosis and treatment plan for the patient. And so the Interventional Orthobiologics Foundation, as well as the Orthobiologics Institute or IOF and Toby, they host tons of different workshops across the country, some across the world, uh, annual conferences, all of these things where you can learn and continue to develop your skills because that's really what it's about, that continued education. You have to keep up to date on the literature, up to date on the different techniques. There's new papers that get published every single week in this field of medicine. Most aren't very good quality, but you have to tease out the bad ones from the good ones and really take away from those good ones. And, and there's tons of doctor's offices, clinics, chiropractic clinics, etc., out there that have been convinced by salesmen to buy their device because it'll generate huge revenue for them because now they can offer PRP or stem cell treatment uh, to their patients. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of them simply aren't qualified to be able to do that appropriately. All right, number three, what type of image guidance is being used for the treatment? The two most common imaging tools are ultrasound and fluoroscopy. I use both of those on a daily basis, both for diagnosis and treatment. And these are really used to visualize important structures and improve injection accuracy, which I'll give some details about that in the next slide. Um, and more importantly, it helps to avoid things that we don't want to interact with. So we don't want to go piercing through a nerve or a blood vessel. Safety is my number one, two, and three priority. If something's not safe, I'm simply just not going to do it. And this image here is a uh, fluoroscopic or x-ray image of an epidural injection uh, on a patient that uh, clearly has a lumbar fusion. That's what those big uh, dark black uh, screws and rods are. And, and so just because you've had uh, a major surgery doesn't mean that uh, all hope is uh, lost. All right, image guidance once again. And so if a doctor has the hubris to say they don't need image guidance in order to do an injection, if it were me, I would walk out immediately. No questions asked uh, because that is just uh, a false statement, unfortunately. And here's some data to, uh, to back it up. And so these are published uh, papers available in the literature. The references are at the end of the slide or at the end of this presentation. Um, so the AC joint, which is the top joint here in the shoulder, uh, Image guided, 94% accuracy, blind injection, uh, not using any image guidance, 68%. Biceps tendon sheath here in the front without any image guidance. Glenohumeral joint, so that's the main uh, go, uh, golf ball on golf tee or ball and socket joint in the shoulder, 93% versus 73% uh, without any image guidance. 72% based on these studies. And another quote that I found from a, a meta-analysis, um, which uh, had dozens of studies uh, 
quote, this study showed that ultrasound guided knee injections were more accurate across every anatomical needle injection site compared with blind injections. Injections made by a blind slash anatomically guided method had inconsistent accuracy rates that seemed highly dependent on the portal of entry. And so in this meta-analysis, any of the ultrasound guided injections had a 90, greater than 95% uh, accuracy. And so this image here on the left, um, is a patellar tendon of a patient that I had treated in the past. Uh, when we looked at the ultrasound, when I first met them, we could clearly see that the tendon was very thickened. That's what's outlined in that pinkish color, the, the, two, the top and bottom. It's about three times thicker than what a normal tendon looks like and what the other side looked like. Um, however, we didn't really see these black holes or what's in yellow. Those are tears that are in the tendon until we actually started injecting it and treating it. And then those tears just opened up so easily. And so even if you do use this, it can be deceiving. But if you don't use any image guidance, then you're certainly not going to see these. And you're not going to be able to target specifically uh, where the, these defects and where these injuries are. All right. Number four what kind of candidate am I for the treatment and the procedures that you're offering? And so orthobiologic treatments, they're not for every single condition. They're not for everything. There are not for everyone. Many factors do affect candidacy, including severity of condition, medical comorbidities. So if you, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, if you have bad COPD, heart failure, if you have different rheumatologic or autoimmune conditions, that can potentially affect outcomes and affect your candidacy uh, as a patient regarding efficacy of these treatments. Lifestyle factors included, if you're morbidly obese, if you're a chronic smoker, if you're a chronic drinker, all of that can Im impact your body's ability to help heal itself. And that's, if I had to give a one sentence explanation, that's what we do. We try and get the body to help heal itself. There's no magic fairy dust out there that's gonna turn you back into a teenager. I wish I would be first in line. I could promise you that. And, and the beautiful thing is that the Regenex network, which uh, the Centeno Schultz Clinic that we have here is the headquarters of the Regenex network. Uh, we have over 100 clinics across the world. Uh, we have the largest database of patient reported outcomes from orthobiologic procedures, which has helped provide information regarding patient candidacy. And so, for example, if a patient has hip pain and they found to have severe hip joint osteoarthritis and the femoral head, which is the ball of the ball and socket joint of the hip, is starting to collapse, that would likely be a poor candidate no matter their health status. And in this context, a poor candidate means that there's a low likelihood of avoiding a surgery like a hip replacement over the next probably three to five years. And, and so using this information, a patient has all of the information available to them so that can, they can ultimately make the best decision that's in their best interest. And that's the beautiful thing about healthcare is that the patient is still in charge. Okay, number five. How is the dosage or concentration of whatever it is that's being recommended uh, determined? And this AI generated image of a superhero that I, I developed, uh, it's actually the syringes that look like that are something that I would call very bad PRP, assuming it's uh, PRP. The red color indicates that there's a high concentration of red blood cells, and that's not something that I would ever inject into a patient. Um, <clears throat> and so most 99 plus percent of regenerative medicine clinics and I use air quotes because what on earth does that mean? They use a bedside centrifuge and automated processing, meaning they have a machine that looks like a printer that sits on a desk. They draw a little bit of blood. They put that blood in and it spits out something that's supposed to be PRP. What is it? How concentrated is it? They have no idea. They don't know what's in it. They just assume that it's supposed to be what it is. And are the red blood cells, white blood cells, how strong are the platelets? They just simply don't know. Uh, fortunately, uh, many of these devices have been tested. And by and large, what is made from the majority of those devices in most cases is something that I personally would never even use to treat a patient because it's simply not strong enough to have an ideal effect. The majority of them don't, you don't create a product that uh, I would even call PRP. It would be more like platelet poor plasma or PPP, which we do use in patients in certain circumstances but that's certainly the exception rather than the rule. Okay, had to add one more. This was probably the most fun to make 
so far, simply because uh, I hear about it every single day, whether it's people at the golf course that have questions or family and friends or, or random strangers that find out I'm a doctor and, and this is what I do. Uh, so I had to add an extra one. And, and this is really important. What structures are uh, recommended to be treated uh, for your condition? And, and so in the body, we have hundreds and thousands of different structures, uh, which all can contribute to appropriate function or lack thereof uh, in your body. And so we have bones, we have muscles, we have tendons, we have nerves, ligaments, labrums, meniscus, discs, all of those things going on. So for example, ligaments in the body, they act like pieces of duct tape to help hold bones together by and large allow you to be able to move properly. And now if those ligaments uh, get uh, loose or stretched out, so it's not like they're torn or damaged, but their properties have changed. And so whether that's due to age, injury, trauma, genetics, lifestyle, you name it, then they're not able to do their job really of, of providing stability. And that can further create other issues. For example, if you're a patient of mine that's uh, listening or will listen, uh, I know you've heard this before, but think about ligaments like uh, lug nuts on a wheel of your car. Say one comes loose. You drive a mile or two, no big deal. Tighten it up when you get home or take it to the shop, no problem. However, if you neglect that and wait a couple oil changes to get that addressed, well, then we're not just talking about loose lug nuts. We're talking about steering issues, suspension issues, alignment issues. God forbid the wheel falls off. All of those things that are much, much, much worse. And so that's why it's important to fully address um, what's going on and make a recommendation to be able to treat all of those structures that are dysfunctional or deficient. And, and <clears throat> last thing, do they examine you to find out exactly what's going on? Unfortunately, in healthcare world, and, and most doctors don't even know how to assess this, much less have the knowledge to be able to diagnose it and treat it appropriately. And so this is a, an MRI, an axial view of the lumbar spine, uh, which is basically a bottom up view. So all the things surrounded in red are different muscles, uh, both uh, around the spine. Uh, the orange uh, bad circle, because I will never claim to be an artist, is the uh, disc at this level. The yellow in the middle are where all of the nerve roots are that will ultimately exit on both the right and left side. Uh, the blue um, crescent shapes are the facet. I didn't even bothered to get. Just this is a prime example of there's a whole lot of different things going on, not only in our lumbar spine, but in every part of our body. And so if something's not working right, then it will likely affect other areas. And it is in your best interest as a patient to be able to find someone who can accurately diagnose these issues and develop an appropriate treatment plan for you. Because the only thing that I care about, two things. Number one is safety. Again, if something's not safe, I just won't do it. Number two is all I care about is you feeling better, getting back to the things that you want to do. All right. So a little bit about us here at the Centeno Schultz Clinic. Uh, we're the world leaders in orthobiologics treatment for musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, we've been here for about the last 20 years. We have invented many of the procedures that are used across the world that other clinics have now adopted or attempted to adopt. Uh, and in, addi in addition, we also do constant research and evolution here. So we have our uh, clinic lab, which is where all of our uh, uh, patient materials are processed, but we have a separate research lab that's only used for research purposes. And, and we constantly evolve our techniques. And so on the right, it's just a very short list of some of the papers that we published recently. And, and really what we try and do is maximize the body's own ability to heal. Um, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. And uh, currently we're actually enrolling patients into a degenerative disc disease study. And so if you have back pain and degenerative disc disease, you may qualify as a study patient for treatment. So if you want to reach out, we can get you in touch with the uh, appropriate people who can do the initial screening and, and all of that. And not everyone will qualify. I can promise you that. Uh, but uh, it does, certainly doesn't hurt to ask. Okay. So some final thoughts. You need a specialized evaluation from a physician that is an expert in this. You need to have a competent discussion about what What's going on? You need to have a plan moving forward. My recommendation is to start conservative and then advance if necessary. It's all about progress. It's not about perfection. We're humans. 
and, and really in the grand scheme of things, this isn't something where you can sit down for 15 minutes with the doctor and, and figure it out. I spend upwards of an hour with all of my new patients because that's the time it takes to really be able to go over your history in detail, do a physical exam, discuss any medical records that you may have, go over any imaging together. I pulled up the images right in front of the patient. We talk about it together. We go through it because a, a knowledgeable patient is the best patient. We also do a diagnostic ultrasound examination if it's indicated. We discuss a plan moving forward. We answer questions. All of those things need to be done so that way you can have the knowledge so that you can make the best decision that you feel is in your best interest. And, and that simply cannot be done well in a short amount of time. You can't get all that information in a 15, 20, 30 minute visit. And so if if you're interested, if you have other questions, uh, you can always uh, reach out to us, antennaschultz.com or regenx.com. If you want to learn more, we have tons of blogs, tons of videos, lots and lots of information about this. So that way you can learn as much about your condition as possible. So you can be an educated patient and you can make the best decisions that are for you. And like I said, references are here. If you ever find yourself uh, not being able to sleep at night, just pull up one of these and you'll probably uh, start counting sheep in about uh, five seconds or so. But again, hope everyone has a wonderful day. If you're watching live or if you're uh, on delay, once again, we'll get this put up on, uh, on YouTube as well as uh, Instagram uh, momentarily. Our staff will get that taken care of. But hope everybody has a, a wonderful Thursday here in Colorado. The uh, leaves are starting to change. So there's going to be a lot of what we call leaf peeping out there. Uh, so the mountain roads are going to be busy. So uh, take care, everyone. Uh, have a blessed day. Thanks. Bye.